So in a lot of schools, we'll see a curriculum place that teaches social behavior or expected pro-social behaviors. And we'll see that done in classrooms. Oftentimes we'll see that done more in elementary and then it seems to die off, if you will, and as we reach middle school and high school. However, from my perspective personally and from what I've observed throughout the years is oftentimes we are more reactive with any kind of mental health or behavioral health challenges rather than being proactive. Hi, Brandy. Thank you so much for being here. Can you please uh, give us a little insight into yourself, what brings you here, and the work you're doing today with Iluma? Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Brandy Samuel, and I currently am the Director of Product for K-12 uh, Mental Health and Related Services products um, for Iluma Therapy. Um, Iluma Therapy is a, a telehealth or virtual um ed tech company that specializes in the support of students um, throughout their entire school career. We really offer a set of solutions for multi-tiered systems of support um, around any kind of behavioral, social behavior, or mental health, um, as well as we offer a full, away, full array of related services for those students um, with individual education plans or receiving services in special education or a Section 504 plan. Thank you. And you were telling me a little bit prior to we prior to start starting the recording about what drew you to all this work and, and your, I guess, uh, affinity for this kind of stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about that and kind of why this all matters to you? Absolutely. Um, I'm a, prior to uh, joining Illuma about two years ago. Um, I'm a career educator, 31 years in public education. Um, and I've been super fortunate to be in various settings, rural, suburban, urban, um, and as well as the virtual world. Um, in many different roles, I started out as a general education teacher and things just morphed, if you will. I was a, a school counselor, a behavior interventionist, very deep in the special education world. I was a coordinator and a director and then ended up as an assistant superintendent for many years with multi facets of student services throughout my entire life even before my professional life i've always been very drawn to those who have challenges or may be in an underdog position um, as i shared a little bit with you mike my very first friend was a girl with multiple disabilities and she and i remained friends throughout my entire school career mm -hmm. and uh, i've just i've always liked to help others i'm very much of a helper and so uh, Iluma, uh, after 31 years in public ed, when I uh, decided to leave public facing ed, I was just kind of on a job hunt. I knew I wanted to do something different. And I, I came across Iluma because I had used virtual therapy services for students that I supported. And so that's how I ended up at Iluma. Thank you. I guess I'm curious. I don't know if it works much different in the U.S. I am in Canada. I, I know relatively it's pretty similar. Maybe can you give us an understanding just of how school mental health in in Toronto or Ontario at least probably about 2010 or so this idea of of school well-being or mental health and all these kind of things really started to blossom quite a bit can you maybe just explain how school systems or schools or classrooms think about these things and what are some of the challenges and potential pathways, I guess, to better taking care of our, everyone involved, teachers, parents, students. Sure. I agree. I, I feel like we very much mirror that here in the U S I would say from the mid two thousands on, we've seen an increased number of states who have social emotional competencies in place or social emotional standards, very much like academic standard. Right. And in schools throughout the U.S. and throughout various states, I know that opinions differ and practices okay. differ. But what we've seen is we've seen a lot of movement to put a social emotional learning curriculum in place. Not all states because we have adversity to that language. But we try to look at building skills, social skills, if you will, um, protective factors, building and teaching protective mm -hmm. factors through a curriculum. 
So in a lot of schools, we'll see a curriculum in place that teaches the social behavior or expected social, pro-social behaviors. And we'll see that done in classrooms. Oftentimes, we'll see that done more in elementary, and then it seems to die off, if you will, and as we reach middle school and high school. And other efforts that we've really tried to establish in the United States is just what the overarching climate and culture of the school look like um, as far as student safety, uh, inclusion. However, from my perspective personally and from what I've observed throughout the years is oftentimes we are more reactive with any kind of mental health or behavioral health challenges, um, rather than being proactive in a, in a direct teaching mechanism with one-on-one or small groups. So that's kind of the, um, I think the continuum or the traverse that we've seen in the United States. Okay. I wanted to, I want to ask you about the, these universal screening tools that you uh, work with Uh, and maybe just on a side note, maybe we can get back to it. There is, some ideas uh, around, or I think there's there's confusion about helping kids understand their emotions and their thoughts and almost like a cognitive behavioral therapy type of model, although it's not unique to that. And do you see, I guess from my experience, I think there's been too much focus on on, on sort of acknowledging how we feel without acknowledging our ability to work through that and recover, like to be resilient and to, and to move forward, so to speak. And then I also think there's a bit too much of a focus on, and this is tricky and it's nuanced, the balance between compassion and responsibility. I think that's how I like to put it often, right? So, and, and I guess that changes as kids get older. And I know I'm throwing out a lot of ideas mm-hmm. at once, but I often see we focus sort of too much on the child is feeling badly. Then we tell the other children, in some sense, it's their fault for this child feeling badly. And we don't teach either side of that page or picture how to process their own experience and then be responsible to each other. So I I hope that makes sense. I know there's a a lot going on there, but can you speak to that a little bit? It makes a lot of sense. And I agree wholeheartedly with you on this very thing. So, you know, just a a bit of an analogy and then to to bring it to the universal screener is much to your point. We talk to students about labeling your feelings. Oh, you're mad. Okay, so now what? Yeah, and, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and when I was uh, getting my master's in school counseling, one of the first um, skills that we learn was when you're working with an individual is, so if someone's crying that's sitting across in your office and you're working with a bit of child or adult and they're crying, then they need to cry and to let them work through that. And that's a hard thing to learn because typically as adults, what do we do? We want to soothe and comfort. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I don't want anybody to take that away. But again, to me, that's just an example of sometimes we need to work through our feelings and Mm -hmm. that's going to look different for everyone. The universal screeners that I have, you know, great understanding of or context with really look at social emotional competencies and not necessarily the mental health internalizing pieces. Meaning, um, for example, the the universal screener that we work with the most is called the DESA. So I'm gonna use it as an example for social emotional competencies. The DESA is really based on core competencies that are part of human being and human development around identities, self-awareness, just how to develop healthy identities and manage emotions, just like you were saying. So whereas a true mental health screener looks more at those internalizing behaviors, such as anxiety, depression, and those things, not that we don't need to address those in society, but we don't directly teach how do I overcome depression. We teach coping mechanisms. Whereas if we're really looking at those social competencies, social emotional competencies, such as, um, Responsible decision making, self awareness, um, self management, building friendships, um, social awareness. Those are skills that we can build. So what, what a universal screener does typically is it looks at the strengths that a child brings to us. Like we may have a child who has wonderful ability to make responsible decisions, but they like social awareness. Hmm. 
So we really look at those gaps and then we're able to build in targeted instruction, just like we would teach math or reading. And we actually teach those skills in a direct or targeted manner. Um, what the screener allows us to do is much like I use this analogy so much is academically in schools, we we use common formative assessments a great majority of the time to assess a student's strengths in reading comprehension or math skills or whatever that may be. Universal screeners allow us to do that with social behavior or behavioral health. And that we can really look at what a child's strengths and weaknesses are. We can identify the skill gaps and we can teach to those. And then we can reassess after a period of time to see if the strategies we've used have been effective or if we need to make adjust adjustments. And um, what the screener does is it gives us a quantitative way to mm -hmm. measure skill acquisition, skills for um to build protective factors, pro-social behaviors, increase resiliency, and of course, with the ultimate goal to be to reduce those risk factors that we see in opposition to a child's resiliency. Right. And and are those done at the classroom level or is it more for students uh, and teachers that are requesting the help? Like, is it something that comes in, the principal says, we're going to do this yeah. and every classroom starts assessing yeah. people? How does it actually kind of work in that way? That's a wonderful question. Thank you for bringing me back to that. Just the term universal. Universal right. means for every student that walks through our doors in the public school. Okay. So the universal screener is what most readily happens is a district or a school will say, we're going to screen every student K through 12, or we're just going to look at grades one, three, five, seven, you know, the odd numbered grades, mm -hmm. or we're only going to look at sixth through eighth grade. So whatever that school identifies, it's going to be universal to the school population or a particular group. Like I mentioned, the DESA that I'm most familiar with, what the DESA does is it has a couple of components. It has something called a mini and a full. So there's a mini DESA and a full DESA. For our students in grades K through five, the teacher rates those students on the skills on a particular, on the, it's actually the Castle five. Um, yep, Castle yep, Collaborative yep. for Academic Social Emotional Learning. So the students are rated on those. It's strengths based to begin with. And then we're able to drill down that data and look at strengths and look at needs and teach to the gaps. Students in grades six through 12 with the DESA actually have a self rater and it's really engaging, um, very gamey, if for lack of a better word. Yeah, yeah. And students get info in real time. So you're really good at making decisions. Would you like to be better at making more friends? And so then it gives them tips, but it also alerts the adults um, of ways of interventions that could be put in place, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm. counseling strategies or techniques. And then we can get feedback from parents on the desk as well. So if we don't know a student well, the parent could also do a rating scale. So we can get a full picture of the student in diff across different environments, um, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, one thought that was coming up as you were talking is the this comes up in workplace settings a lot is we're here to work and get our jobs done. And we obviously want to be supporting people and their well-being and their mental health and that kind of thing. I guess I'm just curious how you think about the school environment and this balance between, yeah, kids are supposed to be in school learning. That's the ideal. Yeah. And then at the same time, they do need to be supported. And I guess sometimes I just think that line is unclear. And sometimes I don't know if our intentions are, or uh, maybe it speaks to the changing landscape of our societies too, because I I was born in 1981. We didn't talk about any of this stuff. And, and not that that was a it's not good or bad per se, but I just, maybe you can speak to how do we balance the need to learn and be in school versus caring for students? And is that best done in the school, out of the school? I don't know. Those are kind of some of the thoughts I often have about this. A, a few thoughts on, on this topic. And I've yeah. thought about this a lot as well, because, you know, I was a child of the eighties. I was born in the sixties. And, you know, in the 80s, we certainly didn't talk about this. You know, when I first started teaching, we talked about behavior, but right. we didn't dare. We didn't really talk about feelings either. 
mm-hmm. you know, with our students. And uh, I'm so glad to see the shift that we can recognize and we can remove stigmatisms. I think that's the biggest thing, Mike, is how do we reduce the stigmatism attached with behavioral and or mental health issues or just our students who come to us in schools with a lack of any type of social competencies of pro-social mm-hmm. behavior. And we have those students mm-hmm. that come. They, you know, yeah. we students don't learn everything by osmosis. They need modeling and they need instruction. I really feel like when you say, what's the best way to address this? Is this in schools or is this outside schools? Again, it's a changing landscape, like you said. I feel like we have to know our students. We have to know the landscape of our community. And we really have to partner with our families. Mm-hmm. When, when we see the most change, growth, engagement in students, we have a full wraparound and we have partnerships with families and communities. That's very hard to put in place. I, under, mm-hmm. I totally understand mm-hmm. that. I've been in very underserved communities and, and oftentimes underserved communities or, or any kind of that have a unique cultural makeup are, are sometimes hard to engage in those. So as a school, we really have to know our customer and our students and our families are our customers. I believe the best way to approach mental health or behavioral health is through an embedded manner. So we embed what we do and throughout the whole thread of our school. It's our culture and our climate, of course, but students don't see as, okay, now we're going to learn SEL. Now we're going to go to math. Now we're going to go to reading or language arts. It's how can we embed this like a thread through all of our instruction? Think about it. If you're doing a universal screener and you identify that everybody in eighth grade has a problem with um, relationship skills, then maybe if we got together as a core set of teachers and we looked at the grade level or we looked at subject um, specific content, where is there a place that we could embed instruction so it occurs naturally in what we're teaching? Is there something we could read in a class that we could get a theme? So then it becomes more generalized for our students. And in my opinion, and I know opinions vary on this as well, we really, that really does reduce those stigmatisms because it's what we do in the school. And, um, I hope that answered your question. I I think it's so many fold. Yeah. I'm having too many thoughts at once here. Um, (laughs) (laughs) one thought I had was one of the, a lot of the work that we did in the high schools here was exactly what you said. How do you build lesson plans that integrate into the classroom to help people connect biology and mental health or art and mental health, or we had a whole bunch of different ones. And it, it, it often just becomes sort of fleeting, like without the school board or the, I don't know if it's statewide there or not, but mm-hmm. maybe with Iluma or just in your experience, how, how do you see the integration of statewide municipal like there's so many moving pieces and so does it matter to you if it's super entrenched is it if one teacher in one school starts implementing these things how do you kind of think about all that you know i think that's an interesting question and and it's really um being being a vendor or um, a partner like you there are so many nuances at the state and local levels and and I told you I have a little bit of a nomadic spirit. Uh, spirit. Yeah. I've been in school districts um, as a teacher and or administration in four different states, four states that have vastly different landscapes. And um, oftentimes there can be state mandates, Mike. But when mm-hmm. you get to the local district, depending on the makeup and the political nature of the school board or that community, we'll, you'll, we'll get pushback. And also just the, the framework that a lot of administrators may bring, you know, all educators, one thing we have in common is we all have a philosophy. Oftentimes right. those philosophies don't match. Right. And, um, and really it's about knowing your school audience. We, we have some school populations. And when I talk about that, I'm not just meaning students. Our students will buy into if, if we present things in a way with our students that is meaningful and engages our students at some label level student buy-in is typically pretty easy if you build relationships with your kids and that takes some time 
the buy-in difficulties that I see really come from oftentimes school administrators and I've been one and I've yeah. been resistant to some buy-in before and, and a, a lot of parents or parent groups or school boards who don't want to do anything that's very controversial. And I can understand that too. I'm not saying mm -hmm, it's right, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I can understand it. So I think that, you know, a little grain of sand can often roll and make the greatest change. And so it's where are we passionate and how do we bring educators together in a school? Maybe it just starts out as a group. Maybe it starts out, I really love peer models that are trained in a good system. And we have so many students, young adults, kids that, that have such empathic spirits and have great understanding and such great social skills that oftentimes kids learn better from our peers, right? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, parents talk about, as parents, we talk about all the time, I've taught my child how to do this, this, and this, and they leave the house and act like they've never done it. And that, that's because that peer influence and that peer support and those friendships are so important. That's a probably a long winded answer without no, very much good. answer, but we really yeah. have to know our students and we, we, it's so important to build relationships. Yeah. I think that's what makes so much of this so difficult. I think is that it is so nuanced and every neighborhood school has its own unique sort of challenges and essences. And, and if I understand the sort of universal screening tools, I, I tend to lean towards this idea of common humanity, right? So our, our experiences yes. are the same. The details are different in some sense. And I think we've been fed uh, perhaps like a social norm of the last decade or so that it's better to focus on our differences than our similarities. And then that causes a storm yeah. of <laughs> conflict, which clearly in the U.S. is is happening. Uh, it's happening right. here too, maybe to a lesser extent. So I guess, does the universal screening tool help that? And I don't know if that's the right question, but this idea that this does apply to everybody and everything, it's not about the details of who you are, where you come from. Like, can you, does that make sense? That question? Yes. A hundred, a hundred percent it does. And again, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I think the whole nature of universal is yes. what normalizes it. Right, and right, right. we're not just going to look at all the students who have been sent to the office the month of April and right. how many incidents they've had. We're going to look at everybody. One of the things I love about screeners, Mike, um, and all screeners have this component, but again, just going back to the DESA, is it focuses on, on differences and similarities. But what I really like about it is it gives us a way to bring kids together at any age and learn from each other. Because what it does is we can identify certain facets of each social competency, if you will, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we can group students, two students up to five. You know, I wouldn't want more than that, but we can ha see, have them see how they're alike. And it's okay not to be like everybody in another group. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like when we normalize it across the school and it's something that everybody's involved in or a vast majority of the students, then it's not setting students apart. What it's trying to do is as a student, it's trying to teach me a skill so that I can show up as a better self to work with all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. What I also love is when I was a school counselor, I love doing group counseling for that very mm -hmm. thing is because yeah. oftentimes kids need a connection. And sometimes in those groups, more often than not, kids connect with somebody they would have never connected with. And, and we know to build resiliency, the, the number one most important thing is a strong relationship, both peer and adult. And one of the things I see the screener do is it allows us to help students form those peer relationships. But if I'm working, be it as a counselor or a social worker or someone trained within the school to teach these things, that's one more trusted adult that I can establish a relationship with for a student. So that's how I see it yep. as far as the differences and similarities. And, and maybe we didn't, I'm not sure if we clarified this, you did describe sort of the different, I guess, domains of assessment. Uh, how does it get to what you were just saying? So the school starts screening everybody, oh, they choose the grades or the whatever, yes. they screen everybody, you get the data, then you have, I guess, processes of interpreting the data, then sure. like, yeah, how does it kind of go yeah. from there? 
So you, you do the screener and it has very robust data and the data is coded, if you will, red, yellow, green, just like you would think. Green is the students compared to um, a norm sample, same age, grade, cultural background, which I like there for, to be that strong cultural correlation. And so, and then our students in yellow, they have the skill that we're looking at developed to a degree, but we would like to build it a little more. And then our students in red are those students who are most at risk of not developing a particular skill. So those are the students that we really want to be strategic in how we present and directly teach the skill, be it responsible decision making, social, social behavior, self-awareness, self-management. And so what are some of the targeted interventions that we can put in place? So, for example, many of our students who might show up in yellow, let's say around um, self-management, could we do a large class lesson in their class and maybe everybody could learn from it? Could we just pull a group of five students? And then when we look at our students who show up as more in that at-risk level, could we pull those students one-on-one and work on interventions and then bring them two together? So it really gives us a way to drill down the data and to identify interventions. Um, a great thing about the DESA that I keep talking about is just because I yeah. know this one the best. And Luma, we actually have a partnership with the DESA. Um, within the DESA are, oh gosh, I don't know the number. It's well over 100, if not approaching 400 interventions that we can apply um, to various age and grade to, to directly instruct skills. And it gives us mechanisms in which we can teach to large groups, small group, and or individual students. Hmm. It sounds like this, uh, I use something called feedback informed treatment for in yeah. therapy. It's a very uh-huh. similar. There's red, green, yellow, yeah. at risk or whatever. Um, yeah. It's a great tool. So helpful. And, and oh, sorry, yeah. Mike. I was Go just going to jump ahead. in. Yeah, yeah. The great yeah. thing for educators with a universal screener that's grouped like that, if you will, or labeled, is we're yep. very used to looking at that for academic skills, such as reading right, and math. Right, 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 so right, it's right. a categorization, just like you. You, I mean, we can all relate to that categorization. For sure. I'm not too connected, I guess, to the thoroughness of these conversations. Although I know in the U.S., sort of reading, writing, math skills are, have fallen off quite a bit over the last couple of decades. And I guess this goes back to that idea of what are we in school to do? Are we here to learn about our emotions or are we here to actually learn? I guess, I don't know if those two things are separate, I guess. But, um, and then I guess that's uh, a bit of a side note too, but screening tool, learning versus, uh, I guess, like academics versus emotional. And then, oh, I had a question tied up in that. I think I've forgotten it. Um, yeah, it's gone. I think it'll come back. <laughs> One other thing I don't want to forget to ask you is, is, is if this stuff connects, if, if you're seeing or how you're thinking about, uh, like social media, cell phones in schools, technology, all that kind of stuff. And is there a, a part of the assess, the universal assessment that measures that? At this time, there's nothing that, um, does measure um, I lost my train of thought too. That, yeah, sorry, that sorry. really looks at <laughs> that sorry, looks yeah. at social media and or okay. electronics. Okay, However, yeah. I think I guess I believe from my observations, and I would I would think you would agree, as I think a lot of us as adults or educators or even parents would agree, is that immersion that we see around social media and electronics really has taken away some of this relationship building ability Mm, that mm, you or I mm. might have come to school with, you know? Um, And so from my observations and in my opinion, I really do believe there's a direct correlation between emotion and academics. I think it goes all the way back, not, not to get into philosophical, but it really Mm -hmm. goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If we don't meet the essential needs, then it's going to be very hard to acquire new information And if we just think about kids developmentally, if the feelings aren't met or they're not fed or any type of physiological need is not met, then that's the primary focus. And that's that's the developmental level that we're at is there's the engagement in academics and learnings prohibited. Um, I'm self-absorbed and trying to deal through why am I so sad? Why am I so mad? Why do I not have friends? why is this thing going on at my house? 
that unless I learn to manage that, my engagement and or my attendance is going to be very limited at school. And hence, my academic outcomes are not going to be where they need to be. And and then it just starts a vis- vicious, vicious cycle. Um, I've observed this over 31 years before I even know what I knew now or I'd even been exposed is when we have kids that don't engage, it's very easy to spiral into I don't go to school. So right. then there's some kind of intervention put in place and I come to school, but yet I'm so behind. So maybe if I act out or I withdraw, then I won't have to be here. And then we start the cycle again. So for me, I, I believe it's so important um, as parents, as educators, for us to understand where those feelings and emotions lie and how are we going to address them. School is not the same as it was when I graduated high school in 1985. And <laughs> it's only going to evolve even more to the landscape's going to change. And this is how I like to talk about it. I, I spent many years working with students on the autism spectrum. and and as well as students with a severe emotional disturbance. And one of the things we talked about all the time is if I come to school missing the learning to learn skills, sit in my chair, ask to take a break, know how to get my paper out, know how not to push somebody down when I'm mad, then I'm not going to learn. Because as a student, I have to come to school with a certain set of skills. And if that means as a school, we have to teach those readiness skills. And for me, that's managing emotion. That's getting your pencil out. Then how are we going to engage a child so that they acquire skills? Sometimes it's going to behoove us, if not a lot of the time, to go back and teach what we may not think we need to teach in schools, but that we must teach so that a child's able to learn. Hmm. And and is that maybe we could run through a process of how the screening uh, to use a case study, so to speak. So okay. screening, classroom, student identified with some needs. Okay. You address the needs and, and like, how does that kind of, I know you've, you've touched on that, but if you could get like super okay. specific okay. and okay. maybe, yeah, you could use the, uh, the one you just gave up sort of autism or whatever. Okay. doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, and then okay. one side question would be, and I don't totally, I think they removed Asperger's right from the assessment language. Could you speak to that a bit too? If, if yeah. you know about why that all happened or what's going on there, you know, I, I'm not a hundred percent well versed in this, but okay. when we, okay. when we talk about autism now, we don't separate Asperger's and autism spectrum disorder. Asperger's okay. is on the continuum of the disorder. It's still within the disorder. You know, we look at the severity of functioning being low to high functioning and um, the particular behaviors that might fall within that functioning area um, strengths, as well as not, I don't want to say weaknesses. I want to say sure, deficits sure. that we need to directly yeah. teach. So it's, it's that full continuum, if you will, around the autism spectrum disorders. Um, if I was going to give an example, I'm just going to break it down um, by a school and a particular grade. So I'm going to use ACME school. Uh, we, we, gave the universal screener. I'm going to use the DESA for an example. We gave the DESA in grades K through five. And um, then I'm going to drill it down and look at uh, Miss Hudson's classroom. And I'm Mm -hmm. going to look at Mm -hmm. one student, Dottie. So um, we're at Acme School, Acme Elementary, and we're a K through five school. And we gave the screener to all grades K through five. And since it was K through five, um, the very first thing that happened is the uh, school administration and all the staff got together and said, these are our assessment windows. We're going to do a beginning of year, middle of year and end of year assessment called the DESA. It's very much like a common formative assessment, such as Dibbles that we would use in reading. So we're going to look at the data similar, but we're looking at social behaviors. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the strengths of all of our students and what I'm going to need every all the teachers to do is you all are going to do a DESA mini for every student in your homeroom. A DESA mini um, takes about, for a classroom of 30 students, takes about five to seven minutes to do wow. the entire yeah. mini. And sorry, did they do it on a, uh, on a piece of paper? Or it's on- electronic-based. It's computer-based. Okay. 
Okay. So it's, um, I go into a dashboard, I rate each of yeah. my students and, um, it just kicks Got me it. to the next student. An okay. interesting thing on the mini for each student on the mini that shows at risk around a particular castle competency, mm-hmm. then I'm going to get kicked as a teacher to something called the full screener. The full screener currently has 70 questions, but when we return to school in August, it'll be down to 40 questions. And the interesting thing, Mike, is that the entire assessment's renormed and it'll be the only universal screener on the market with post COVID norms. The norms are from 23, 24. So I'm really excited to see what that's going to look like just for the DESA. So at Mm -hmm. any rate, um, I'd prepare all my teachers with that. All those students who don't look at risk on the mini, we just take the info that we got, but then those students that we go to the full screener on, we're going to answer all those questions and they may not look at risk once we do the full. There might just have been a nuance in the mini that would have been like a false positive for a skill gap. So the next thing we're going to do as the school administrator or the school counselor, I'm going to dive into the data and I'm going to segregate it by grade level because then it's going to be easier to manage from the counseling or the administrative perspective. And then I'm gonna have grade level meetings. So I'm gonna talk to all the kindergarten teachers, all the first grade, like a in a PLC, a professional learning community. And we're gonna look at the data. So, okay, so let's just focus on fifth grade for a minute. So fifth grade, um, I've got two teachers, Miss Llewellyn and Miss Hudson. And Miss Llewellyn, your classroom looks really good. You have about, 10 students who could work on responsible decision making. So maybe those students need to go with the school counselor, two separate groups. Let's go for a a period of um, maybe let's go for like six weeks, once a week, a short duration um, and work on those skills. Ms. Hudson, your classroom, it looks like 60% of your students have trouble with self-management. So how about we start with a class ride, a class wide a large group lesson once a week for six weeks. Could we build it into like your language arts class? So maybe we could read a book and you could tie it into the instruction that you have going on. And and then uh, we're going to go from there. So we're going to do that for say six weeks. And then it, we're going to get to mid-year and we're going to reassess using the same screener. And we're going to look at how our students have responded to those interventions. And let's say we get to mid-year and we've done really well. Miss Llewellyn's class looks good, except she has one student now who really needs some help with um, uh, self-awareness. So the counselor mm-hmm. might pull that student. Miss Hudson's class is looking better. Like she's down to where she has five students who look at risk around that self-management piece. So we're going to keep going with some skills on them. Maybe we're going to pull them individually now. And then we're going to repeat that same cycle at the end of the year. Um, while we just were talking about one grade level there, what I would do as a school administrator or counselor is I want to get a theme grades K through five. What do I see as being a need and what do I see as being a strength? And then I'm going to build some climate or school wide activities. Maybe we have some assemblies. Maybe we have some specific days. Maybe we look at building in those peer models from every grade, not just our oldest grade. So um, that's, that's. Yeah. Yeah. That's. And so does the data aggregate to the last point you made? So you get like a school wide yes. themes that yes. pop up or whatever. Can. Um, interestingly, yeah. you could get a If you did it district wide in the entire wow. school district, yeah, yeah, you can yeah, get a yeah. district theme, a school theme, a classroom theme, and then individual wow. students. Wow. Yeah. That's- it drills down very, uh, uh, very granular. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you need serious buy-in eh, from the school board yes, to get yes, at, at that yes. level, obviously, but at the school yes. levels, in my experience, sort of doing stuff, not at that level, but we used to have this annual event. It got disrupted by COVID, but where we would partner with the school. So we're partnered with the school board. Then there would be whatever school, et cetera, is interested. We'd go into the school, do a presentation. The teachers would take the lesson plans They'd, the kids would do the work and then we'd have this big event at the end of the year. And yeah, it takes a lot of work to kind of get that across the board, so to speak, or even across a couple of schools. Although at the same time, I, 
that would be amazing if we could do that clearly. Yes. Do yeah. yeah where, where is that something you think is just inevitable in some ways that school boards are going to start at least at some level assessing these things or do they already? Um, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? I, that, that kind of yeah, question? a hundred yeah. percent. In my observations, it yeah. seems to be the climate of whatever the community is. You know, yeah. I see the universal screener, regardless of which one, which specific tool a district chooses, yeah. is it's a proactive way to address mental health, yeah. um, behavioral health, or risk factors. And, and I really believe it's a way to circumvent a lot of school violence that we might see. Yeah, and yeah, I don't yeah. mean the most extreme form. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, going yeah, all yeah. the way from bullying to a school shooting. Um, yeah, is yeah. It's a really way, if we could get a glimpse into what's going on with our students, and we have the opportunity to proactively teach and to proactively be engaged with the family before we have to be reactive. My w real wonder is, Mike, if we could get total buy-in, some of the issues that we could circumvent and prevent. And I know that it is a huge time and training effort to, to put proactive strategies in place. I've sat yeah, in those yeah. administrative seats and it does require buy-in and you, and you do have to sell it. Yeah. You know, the expense of the universal screeners, it's not so much of a monetary expense. I, I think one of the things that I would say to districts is what's less expensive, being proactive or being reactive to a crisis. And not to say that, you know, I know we have some crisis situations that there have been a lot of proactive measures put in place and it didn't prevent those. However, it would be a step or a tool that at least we could acknowledge and identify in a quantitative way and make data driven decisions. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe children are data, but I believe sometimes, um, in my experience, we've made a lot of qualitative decisions based on observational data that haven't really served us yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. I know we're running out of time yeah. that I know, uh, I think this applies from a therapist perspective. There's this great saying therapists want to know how they're doing, but they don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And, and also that therapists are, are actually poor judges of how their clients are doing. And so I use sort of a screening tool to measure both of those things because I don't want to be skewed by my own bias and my own ignorance or my own unwillingness to acknowledge where I'm being inadequate, so to speak. And yeah, yeah and that's where the data stuff is so useful because yeah. it, 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 I guess it helps to remove the teacher bias or the teacher uh, unwillingness or even the school's unwillingness on a whole to look at their inadequacies. And and it right. maybe it depersonalizes it a little bit as well, where you sort of don't take it so personally. Yeah. I right. don't know if I that, agree. you've had any seen, seen that happen. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. We're, we're able to do that with academics, Mike. So we don't right. take it personally right, 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 when right, we right, have... Right, right. <laughs> 20 students at a grade level needing additional targeted instruction around reading comprehension. We right, take it as right, that's right, a right. deficit we have to teach. Right, so if right. I really had a, um, a bandstand to get on, it would be, let's take a look at behavioral health. It, I know a lot of people that mental health still has a connotation, but I sure. know in schools, I was there long enough. We all face behavioral health challenges <laughs> right. every, every day is let's look at it in a way that's not going to identify our shortcomings or what we're doing right or wrong. Let's look at it in a way that we could be proactive and we could teach. And uh, while I wasn't a therapist, I was a school counselor for many years. Mm -hmm. I, as you know, I shared earlier, I was in very high need schools. Um, I, I typically work with our students with um, severe emotional disturbance. So there was a lot of mental health and behavioral health. While I might have observation of that student that I could see great change, that was one-on-one. -on -one. Right. It wasn't in a generalized setting. So sometimes we do need to step back and take a look inside to see how mm -hmm. we can grow mm -hmm. and improve. Mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it is yeah. hard. It's hard for all of us. It's hard for yeah, me. Yeah, it it's is. hard for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah no yeah. doubt. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. it is. And I guess any other things... Oh, I'm yearning to have this conversation go longer. <laughs> Anyhow, any other things we didn't say or just 
maybe personal areas of interest in education or student mental health uh, that you want to share or talk about a bit? I just challenge anyone that works with students to take a new approach. If you're not using a universal screener, think about it. Um, it opened my eyes to so much. If if you're faced with a school board or school administration that's resistant, like we're not going to dig into mental health because what if we identify all these incidents of depression and anxiety and we yeah, don't have the yeah, staff yeah. to manage those, then then look at a screener that is looking at social competency. That's okay. looking at yeah, ways yeah. to directly teach a skill that's an inherent part of human development anyway. Think about it as, as just teaching identity or being able to recognize and cope with the day to day. And, and think about it from that perspective. And that yeah, would be my challenge to everyone. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, the time. So one, one thing maybe you can speak to this briefly is uh, at my children's school, it's a K to six. It's a pretty small community cool, school, you know, middle, middle, upper class community. So it's very sort of, you know, everyone sort of has what they need, so to speak. Most people, um, in terms of the hierarchy of needs, if you will, and, and what we're aiming, we're trying to get start sort of. A, are you familiar with Jonathan Haidt? Jonathan I am. Haidt. I have his book. Yeah. Right, I have his new. Yeah, book he's right fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's very good. So we're trying to implement <laughs> yeah. the phone free schools idea, and yes. we're starting very local, uh, and then aiming to bring in the middle schools in the neighborhood, which is in Canada or Toronto. It's generally seven and eight. Sometimes it's six, okay. seven, eight. Um, are, are the universal screening tools, are they unique? Like does Eluma have pri pri proprietary ownership of those things? Are there universe, like just normal ones that people, if they don't have resources or don't have time or whatever, can they access their own screening tools that sort of fit the validity, you know, of these tools that yeah. you use and, and how yeah. might they start implying, implementing that? So the ones I'm most familiar with really have a school base and they're school initiated. However, yeah. you know, with a simple internet search, there are yeah. various screeners that if a parent wanted to look at and just say, Hey, where does my child lie within social emotional mm -hmm. competency? Yeah, 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 there yeah. are a lot of things out there. And then really I find Castle, um, the Castle website to have a wealth of information for school, community and home. Um, and they're, they're such a trusted organization with so many years of strong research. Yeah, that's that fantastic. Yeah. Any yeah. direction I took from Castle, I would feel comfortable sharing with a parent or using as a parent or a community. So yeah. even if you're in a school and your school's not open to this, just start exploring through the Castle website. And right. uh, they, they support all of us school wide. And um, it's truly what it is. It's a collaborative. And so I yeah. think that would be a great starting point and, and just go from there. Okay. Thank you. I guess all, all good things must come to an end. So thank you so much for Thanks, everything. Mark. If you want to maybe just direct people to the eLuma services or okay. website or how, how, if people wanted to follow up, I know, do you, are you allowed to provide services in Canada? Do you know? Uh, we, I think, I believe we can. Mark. Okay, it cool. would just be yeah. based on credentialing of the yeah. um, providers. Um, I would I would have to check in with our recruiter. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. I know that we actually have some providers that live in Canada. Okay. And cool. um yeah, so if you wanted to check us out, we're elumatherapy.com and uh we're um busy building out a new website that's pretty good. It's uh, got some good info. We have some great blogs for educators and parents. Um nice. if you want to check those out. Um, we also um, have webinars that you can access some mm -hmm. recordings if you wanted to learn more about just multi-tiered support and how the universal screener fits there. We have a, a two great webinars about that. So, yeah, awesome. I would love for you guys to join in and uh, look at what we have. And again, my name is Brandy Samuel. I'd be happy for anybody to reach out. And I, I really appreciate the time and the interest, Mike, and was glad to be here yeah. today. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, well, best of luck with all the work. It's important stuff, and hopefully it does lead to better outcomes for our students uh, and our societies, so. ultimately, really, is what ultimately, it's all about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content, and otherwise, have a great day. Peace out. <laughs>